Hey there, this is Natalie. And as some of you probably know, for about the first year I had this channel, I was mainly a ReZero YouTuber. I still make ReZero content, but I've also branched out into general anime content over the past six months. However, as I've mentioned in a few videos recently, I'm also going to be making analysis stuff about Mushoku Tensei, or Jobless Reincarnation to use the English name. I loved the first core of the anime and knew the novels by reputation, but I only just had time to get into reading them, and having finished the main story, I'm now getting into the various side stories, though there aren't as many as for ReZero, so I might actually get some sleep sometime soon. In case you weren't aware, the main story of Mushoku Tensei is finished, and ReZero is not, so for the purposes of this comparison video, I won't be discussing anything to do with what I thought about the ending of Mushoku Tensei. That will be in another video talking about my general impression of the Mushoku Tensei series as a whole. But why do I want to compare these two series at all? Haven't we established already that that is stupid and pointless? Well, yes. I hate the Twitter war between these two fan bases that pops up every now and again, and I hate it because honestly, there's no reason to even choose between them. Like a harem protagonist, you can just have both with absolutely no negative consequences. I appreciate it can be kind of fun to pick a side and have a meaningless argument, but there's football for that. Still, I do think that when you're analysing something, it can be interesting to compare it to something else with some similarities and equivalent quality. To me, these two series can't be compared in many ways due to doing totally different things, but they also kind of have to be compared, because really they're the only peers to each other. They're around the same age. In fact, the first volumes of both light novels came out on the same day in Japan though ReZero is a few months older as web novels. The authors are friends, and they work in a similar way, using a free web novel as their first drafts, before revising what they have into light novels. And there are also some similarities in some of the things included. More than you might think, in fact, but I won't go into that due to spoilers for anime onlys. Both series have large casts, mysteries that span over the entire story, and events from the past lore that are relevant to the protagonists' lives. They both have political intrigue, interesting characters with plenty of depth, and strong world building. But the main reason to compare them as a way of analysing them is that they are easily the two best, more serious modern isekai. I say more serious because I also rate Konosuba very highly, but that's primarily a comedy, so much more difficult to compare to either of these. I know not everyone agrees with this, but while there are plenty of other isekai I find enjoyable and high quality in terms of story, there just isn't anything else as epic and ambitious as these two series, at least from stuff that has been given an anime adaptation. There's a lot of isekai written by talented authors, but in many cases, isekai series are something an author will do several of in their career, along with numerous other series in other popular genres and it's often kind of throwaway fast fiction. And I'm not judging there, that's pretty much how I've viewed every isekai series I've written. But with ReZero and Mushoku Tensei, you get the sense that this is the important career-defining project for each of their authors. They certainly both do other stuff, but they committed many years of their lives to big epic series that they poured all of their talent into. You could say that they're kind of the magnum opus for each author, not in the sense that they may never create anything as good again, neither of them are very old, but in the sense that they're taking these works a lot more seriously than someone banging out their seventh cute gimmicky isekai series. It's not an exaggeration to say these stories are kind of their legacies. Still, with my usual simping for the authors part out of the way, I want to compare how each of these stories do things differently and how that choice strengthens each story, rather than looking at which is better. I will say at the end which one I like best, though it's only by a small margin, and I'll talk about why I slightly prefer it, but you'll see that my reasons are completely down to personal taste, rather than anything I could say was actually better, or more well executed. I'll keep any mention of events from after the anime for both Mushoku Tensei and ReZero as vague as I can, 
to avoid spoiling any important plot points. But there will be information about things like the world building and some of the things touched on in the story that won't be obvious yet from either anime. So while this is going to be fine for most anime onlys, if you want to know absolutely nothing from outside of what's been shown so far, you may want to give this a miss. So I'm going to start by comparing the premise of each story and the general isekai situations of the two main characters. As you'll know, the ways that Subaru and Rudius arrive in their new worlds are completely different, as are their lives in their previous worlds. I've said before that the unnamed 34-year-old man, who is reincarnated as Rudius, is essentially what the 17-year-old Subaru, who gets summoned to another world as his current self, is afraid of becoming. Subaru has become a shut-in, though not due to bullying like Rudius's past self, but due to feeling out of place and inadequate at school, where he has an inferiority complex around his father. He's only been hiding away in his room for three months, but he knows it's not a good thing. He knows what people who fall into that cycle end up like, and he's afraid of wasting his life, but he has panic attacks at the thought of actually going to school. He doesn't have friends, but he does get along with his parents, though he to some extent feels like they're enabling him, and perhaps really wants them to get angry with him and force him to do the things he can't get up the courage to do himself right now. Effectively, Subaru definitely isn't past the point of no return. He's young, and his parents see what he's going through as something he needs, some time to sort his head out, a phase that will pass. But Rudius, and I'm going to keep calling him Rudius while talking about his past life too because it's easier where we don't know his original name, he is past that point. After being bullied, he became a shut-in, but it wasn't a phase that passed. His parents and siblings tried to help at first, but their words never got through to him. Contrary to what we see, he didn't spend all of his time jerking off and playing dating sims. He was actually very passionate about computers, and acknowledges later on that there were all kinds of careers he could have had if he hadn't become the way he did but various things he told himself held him back. He was an adult with no true life experience, all of his perception of the world based on the internet and fiction. He hadn't had a friend since junior high, and he'd obviously never had a relationship, causing his perception of sex to become twisted. With no real partner to worry about, but equally no real experience to satisfy him, he, like a lot of people in that situation, ended up spiralling into a mindset where anything that turned him on was fair enough, which is why the character appears to be such a general degenerate in that respect in his new life, until he becomes physically old enough to actually start having real relationships and experiences. Rudius passed that point of no return a long time ago. At the time when he dies, it's virtually impossible to see him coming out of the situation he's in. His parents die, but due to a combination of apathy about his family and his shut-in mentality, he doesn't go to their funeral, staying home and jerking off to something highly questionable instead, and what that is depends on which version you read. This is certainly a low point in his behaviour, and shows just what a piece of trash he's turned into, but it is swiftly punished. His brother comes into his room and smashes his beloved computer with a baseball bat, his siblings beat him badly, and then he's cast out into the streets with just the clothes he's standing in. He now has nowhere to live because his parents are dead and his siblings are sick of him. He's beaten up and covered in blood, and he's staggering around in the rain. He's probably outside for the first time in years, wondering what there is that he can possibly do. He can barely speak either where he so rarely spoke out loud for all of the time he was a shut-in. In an effort to at least do one non-pathetic thing, he saves some teenagers from being hit by truck coon, and he dies. The end of a wasted, pitiable life he can only regard with regret and self-loathing. Now, Subaru's circumstances before being isekai'd aren't fully explained until Arc 4, whereas we see a lot of Rudius's in the prologue, only for them to be expanded on throughout the story in things he remembers and thinks about. This is because we don't need to know much about Subaru's life in the original world to understand him, 
so it can be left as something that can be revealed as part of a plot point later on, his trial of the past. Subaru doesn't confront his past until he's already overcome a lot of the problems he had, so it's more revealed as a way to reflect how much he's developed in the new world than as something we need to know as part of the setup for his motivations and personality. He's summoned rather than reincarnated, carrying on his life in the same body, so he doesn't get to grow up as a citizen of this world, learning about it at a normal pace. The expectations on him are immediate, and what we see in the early arcs is Subaru trying to rise to the occasion after being thrust into an absurd situation. Sometimes he fails horribly at being the person he wants to be and needs to be for things to work out for him here, like his missteps in arc 3 that lead to him being beaten by Julius and Amelia walking away from him. He's basically being forced hard to confront the weaknesses and personality flaws he has and to grow up under intense pressure. And as the story goes on, he does manage to do that. But the flaws and immaturities Subaru was carrying are fairly normal ones, plus he has a lot of upsides to his character, like his desire to save people and his outgoing nature. To put it simply, Subaru was never truly trash, so what he's seeking in this story is growth rather than redemption, to keep on being himself but to improve, rather than needing a total do-over. Why he was summoned, why he was given return by death, and what his connection to this world is form some of the most interesting mysteries in the story, so the isekai thing in ReZero isn't played off as pure luck or the whims of some deity who explains everything before sending him on his way to become a hero. It's supposed to be abrupt and confusing for him, and so it's handled immediately at the start of the story, with Subaru being given no breathing space at all, setting the tone somewhat for how ReZero is going to be. With Rudius, however, we need to see just what a mess he'd made of his past life before anything else, because it's essential to understanding why this second chance at life is so important to him, and why he's so determined to work hard and live a fulfilling life, now he's being reborn. This is literally the premise of the series, someone who royally screwed up the first time around, trying to make something of a new life overcoming all of the things that were wrong with him and holding him back before, forming relationships he'd never had before, and even properly growing up this time around. If Subaru had been killed and reincarnated as a baby like Rudius, this wouldn't work for ReZero, just as Rudius in his loser form being summoned to the Mushoku Tensei world to try and carry on his life there wouldn't work either. There are really three forms of start to an isekai story. First, the one where people get summoned or teleported to another world, or die but are sent to the new world as their current selves. This is what we see in ReZero, Konosuba, Shield Hero, I'm Standing on a Million Lives, and many others. Second, they die and are reincarnated as a baby, going through the full process of growing up in the new world, but with all of their memories intact. We see this here in Mushoku Tensei, but it's also in Tanya the Evil, Assassin Aristocrat, The Wise Man's Grandchild, and when they're reborn as a non-human, in Slimy Sakai and So I'm a Spider, So What? Then, thirdly, someone is either reincarnated or summoned, with all of their memories intact, but they're put into a new, older body, either as someone who originally lived in that world, as in Ascendance of a Bookworm, or the truly awful The Eighth Son Are You Kidding Me, or into the body of something like an RPG character, as happens in Overlord, Log Horizon, and How Not to Summon a Demon Lord. Which one an author chooses sometimes doesn't really matter that much to the story, if the goal is just for someone to end up having cool adventures in another world. Admittedly, usually the baby reincarnation option is only chosen when it's either particularly relevant to the story to see the character grow up, or in the case of The Wise Man's Grandchild, because it probably could have just been a fantasy series about someone OP from that setting, but they wanted the isekai tag on it. This is because, usually, watching the power fantasy isekai protagonist being a helpless baby or a small child isn't all that cool, so these bits get in the way if they're not essential to the story you want to tell. If they're not, 
you'll either choose a different type of isekai or time skip through childhood rapidly just to show some important moments, aiming to get to the more conventionally interesting teenage years sooner rather than later. With Mushoku Tensei and ReZero though, the style of isekai used is the only style that would work for the character arcs and the mysteries the story will contain. And in both cases, the isekai event remains an important factor in the story throughout. It's not simply forgotten once the characters become well integrated into the new worlds. There are mysteries around other characters who've been brought to these worlds. There are mysteries around why it happened to begin with. And the knowledge of the protagonists having had these previous different lives is never far from their thoughts. Should they tell the people close to them where they really came from? Would they believe it? Would they be horrified? Questions like this are always dealt with with some weight in both of these stories, because isekai isn't just a way to kick things off and put a protagonist in an interesting new world they don't know anything about, so they can be an audience surrogate when it's exposition time. Isekai is used to its full storytelling potential. Mushoku Tensei, unusually, doesn't go for the speedrunning through to teenage years approach. Trusting that in a story about someone's entire new life, the childhood years are both necessary and interesting to explore. It spends a lot of time on Rudy's childhood, with the first really dramatic turning point taking place when he's 10, that being the teleportation event we saw in Core 1 of Season 1 of the anime. Admittedly, I'm not a fan of child protagonists myself, or children in general to be honest, and so I was a bit disappointed when I started watching the anime and it seemed Rudy wouldn't be reaching adolescence in two or three episodes. But Maganote knows what he's doing, and I really felt none of those reservations once I got into the story. Looking at it from much further on, it was a good move, and in fact the only move that would work for what Mushoku Tensei is trying to do. But all of this feeds into the next point I want to compare these two stories on, and that is story structure. ReZero isn't finished yet, so we don't know exactly how long of a period it will cover, but we can make a reasonable guess based on how long the royal selection is said to last, which is three years. There are going to be 11 arcs, and the current arc, arc 7, does sit about halfway through that period of time, so this does seem to fit. This means ReZero is going to be a lot longer than Mushoku Tensei, given we're at 27 volumes currently, partway through arc 7, whereas Mushoku Tensei finished at volume 25, but it will be covering a much shorter period of the protagonist's life, because Mushoku Tensei covers Rudy's whole life story, beginning as a baby, though admittedly, like any good story, it does keep to the most interesting periods of his life, so when things calm down for him in his mid-twenties, there's a lot less content devoted to the periods in his life after that. Now, it's inherent to ReZero's premise, where it uses a redo mechanic, then it needs to spend more time on any important incident. Arc 4, which is by far the longest arc, at around 1.5 million words in the original web novel version, only covers a period of a few days, whereas one of the longest arcs in Mushoku Tensei, the teleportation incident, which is currently being covered in the anime, covers a three-year period. That one arc would basically be the entire time period ReZero will probably end up covering. Now, ReZero is more conventional in this sense. Isekai series do usually just cover a period of a few years, if that, where the most notable campaigns of the protagonist's life in a new world take place. But Mushoku Tensei's premise, being more about someone making the most of a new life, makes a lot more sense if we get to see his whole life. We need to see him work to earn his OP protagonist status, rather than a quick training montage, and then he's equipped with it right away. We also need to see him do things like having jobs and relationships, and we need to see if he has any children, and all of that stuff that forms a lifetime, as well as seeing him get involved in more interesting fantasy plots and mysteries. We don't need this with most isekai stories, but we do here, because that's the point. Especially when you consider that Rudius's presence in this world, particularly with him being so proactive about doing as much as he can in it, 
actually has a big impact on the way the future of that world will change from how it would have been otherwise. I'm being vague about that because, spoilers, but it is a thing. We need to have seen him take action in a lot of situations over many years and become embroiled in the affairs of lots of different characters for his impact on the world to feel justified. So how is Mushoku Tensei structured to make that possible without it feeling like not enough time is spent on the major events? Well, as you might expect, there are lots of time skips. Even ReZero has these, where some arcs only cover very short periods of time, and these are handled by the author providing interlude chapters or side stories that show some of the things that happened during these more peaceful parts of the story. But in Mushoku Tensei, time skips are used to cover periods where Rudius is doing something we know he's doing, but which we don't especially need to see. For instance, training, doing general adventuring to make money, researching something, or traveling. The world of Mushoku Tensei takes a long time to traverse, with journeys between some locations, particularly early in the story, taking a year or more to complete. This kind of journey wouldn't fit with the tighter timeline in ReZero, so the worlds of both series are built to accommodate travel methods and distances that are appropriate to the plot, while still allowing the whole world, in each case, to be accessible if the author wants to explore it. This is partially achieved by Mushoku Tensei's world being bigger than ReZero's and having something ReZero's doesn't, oceans, which can add a lot to both the time and difficulty of getting between important locations, but we'll come to the world building later. Now, the way the time skips are executed, with a brief recap of what happened, followed by an update on the current situation, all delivered in Rudius's voice, which is something else I'll come to in just a minute, don't make them feel jarring. Plus, the periods skipped are never ones when any big developments take place for Rudy's character. So while they allow him to age at a rate that fits the story, they never make you feel like you missed him actually growing up, if that makes sense. This balance of telling an entire life story in a series and not having time skips where it feels like either nothing happened at all or cool stuff happened that you wish had been explained more is hard to strike. In fact, even the time skips in stories that cover a far shorter period can be hard to execute well. For instance, the big time skip in The Promised Neverland, which even in the far better manga version, felt like kind of it was just rushing things and not showing us some of the events that were probably interesting. Though some other stories pull off very extreme time skips with no issues at all, as I talked about in my video about time in Hoseki no Kuni, which has centuries long time skips and may even now be skipping forward by 10,000 years, yet still doesn't feel that weird because of the way the setting, characters, and storytelling style work. With time skips being difficult to handle, and Mushoku Tensei needing to use them frequently to work at all, it's clear that this was something that fed into the world design, and the fact that the plot requires Rudius to travel a lot, earn money doing grindy work, study, and train as these are all things that can be used to allow time to pass without feeling like he was just chilling out, given that wouldn't suit the premise. In ReZero, smaller time skips can be used not to allow the characters to age especially, but to allow relationships to age. This is so that it doesn't feel like the people who became close to Subaru have, from their perspective, only known him for a short while, due to the reset mechanic. Characters, particularly the Emilia faction, need to have been shown to have spent a lot of time getting to know Subaru without any resets, so some peaceful time between some arcs where Subaru doesn't die are necessary to make their relationships feel less one-sided. Of course, if Subaru is just chilling out with his friends, training, and not risking death for, say, a year, that's going to feel like filler content, so Tape handles it with a time skip and some cute side stories. Because the reasons for the time skips are different, they're handled differently, but in both stories, they're approached in ways that work. Now, outside of the period of time the stories take place over, and how that time is handled, the actual structure the series have is pretty conventional, with arcs that cover important periods or campaigns for the protagonist, and which each have their own particular objectives, motivations, and win or lose conditions but which also contribute to a larger overarching story, 
with new things related to that being revealed, or twists in that overarching story occurring within the events of an arc. Both series have introduced fairly large casts by about the end of their third arcs, and so each arc will team the protagonist with a portion of that cast, plus often some new characters, leaving the whereabouts and actions of other characters on the back burner until those characters become involved with what the protagonist is currently doing again. However, this is also handled a bit differently between ReZero and Mushoku Tensei, and to talk about how that's done, I also need to first take a look at another area where they're different, and that is point of view. So, ReZero is predominantly written in the third person. There are a few experiments Tape did in the web novel, with writing some first person chapters from different characters' perspectives. For instance, the infamous Liliana chapters in the web novel version of Arc 5. But these weren't well received, actually leading people to hate that character, and the chapters to be changed for the light novel version. In fact, Tape himself said that he felt like he was getting stupider whenever he'd just been writing in Liliana's voice. Not only is ReZero almost all in the third person, it also follows a pattern where it will limit itself only to Subaru's perspective, unless it's outside of a death loop. This makes sense. There isn't much point in showing us another character's perspective if things are going to be reset and whatever happened to them and whatever they learned won't be permanent. Even when following other characters, it generally sticks to only showing us things that Subaru either knows himself is about to find out anyway, or which he could reasonably be told about off screen. So things that happen to allies of Subaru that they may report back to him, as with a lot of stuff in Arc 5, or things that happen to other main characters close to Subaru, such as what Amelia saw in her trials in Arc 4. It doesn't mean that Subaru definitely does know all of these things, but we're essentially kept in a position where we don't know a lot of information that Subaru or at least the group on Subaru's side, doesn't. When information well outside of Subaru's access is given, it's usually in side stories, which can allow us to follow what other characters are doing that Subaru isn't aware of, without breaking that sense that we're trying to figure things out with him in the main story. The first time we get a full chapter from the perspective of someone Subaru would consider an enemy, that tells us things Subaru definitely doesn't know and won't know quickly afterwards, is, unless my memory is failing me, in Arc 7. It isn't unusual for stories to start to do this type of thing in the second half though. Even Harry Potter, which sticks rigidly to only giving information Harry knows for the first few books, starts to have occasional chapters that show meetings between the antagonists that give the reader far more information than Harry has after book 4. It can keep curiosity up and allow some slightly different things to be done with plotlines after having gotten the reader used to the way the protagonist thinks and approaches things. Mushoku Tensei, however, is predominantly narrated in the first person by Rudius, with occasional sections switching to the first person perspectives of other characters, often to show what they're thinking during interactions with Rudius, plus occasional chapters told from a third person perspective, which are usually to show what other characters are doing far away from where the current arc is taking place and which often have some narrative flair, or some kind of framing device to them, to make them more mysterious, funny, or whatever makes the scene more interesting. Now, I personally have a really strong preference for third person writing, both as a reader and a writer, so I wasn't all that excited when I started Mushoku Tensei and realised it was written that way. I kind of get sick of one character's voice as opposed to an author's less stylized narrative, and I also find it a bit kind of cringy when it feels like I'm supposed to be thinking the made up character is talking to me rather than the author telling me a story. That's very much a personal preference, and I know a lot of people find first person more engaging, as well as more natural to write, but it's quite a strong personal preference. However, it should have been obvious to me that Mushoku Tensei would be written that way, because that's really the only way you can keep putting across the thoughts and story of a man who's very different on the inside to how he's perceived on the outside. In the anime, we have the moments of narration from the old Rudeus to reveal his hidden, more adult thoughts during the childhood of his reincarnated self, 
And that, I think, works really well. But given this series truly is just Rudy's story, as you'll know if you've read it until the end, it makes so much more sense that it's him telling it to us and giving us insights into his issues and experiences from his previous life that will never come up in the dialogue or plot. Yes, you can describe a character's thoughts and feelings in the third person, but it has a very different feel to their unfiltered, sketchy thoughts, their weaknesses and fears, and the things they're ashamed of, all being told in their voice, with no middleman. The too much information cringe element that can come about from the intimacy of first person perspective actually works in Mushoku Tensei's favour too, when it comes to Rudeus. Rudeus is supposed to make you cringe at first. He makes himself cringe. He uses all kinds of embarrassing euphemisms and metaphors for his penis. He makes weird distinctions between who is and isn't a virgin, particularly immediately after he isn't one. He says unfiltered things about how he finds it weird that he isn't attracted to his sisters. And because Rudeus is actually quite astute at knowing what he should and shouldn't say out loud in this world, he can only say those things in his head, or rather, to us. This is kind of unlike Subaru, who while not having an unusually pervy side to his character, will blurt out references to anime and video games in conversations with people who will definitely have no idea what he's talking about. We can be told what he is thinking or feeling, but if the author just wants to show him coming out with something embarrassing or silly, with Subaru, you can pretty much just have him do it in dialogue. Where Subaru's inner and outer selves have far less difference between them than Rudy's, we can understand Subaru without him narrating the story. It's also the case that Subaru, while being the protagonist, isn't necessarily the main character of ReZero, that being Emilia, at least according to Tape. Rudy, however, is definitely the main character of the story that starts when he's born and ends when he dies, regardless of what loose ends may still be left in this world. And so it's vital to the story that we understand him and can follow how much he changes by not just his actions, but by those unfiltered thoughts. When we get first-person chapters from other characters' points of view in Mushoku Tensei, these more often than not serve to show how other characters are reacting to or thinking about Rudeus. This isn't always the case. Sometimes it's simply that the part of the plot needs to be relayed by a character other than Rudy, but quite often, a chapter will start in one character's voice, then switch to another's as the scene progresses. So you may see Rudeus starting off a particularly heavy conversation from his point of view before the perspective switching to the person he's talking to, or vice versa. It avoids basically replaying the same entire scene from different perspectives, which can be monotonous, but switches between Rudy and other characters when it's necessary to know what another character is thinking. Whether they're persuaded by what Rudy's saying, for instance, any doubts they're not voicing in the conversation, or just their general impression of Rudy, which will usually be different to how he thinks of himself. Again, this is important when we're dealing with a main character who has a lower opinion of himself than the people he becomes close to could ever have of him. But what it also means is that we regularly know a lot of things Rudeus doesn't know about how the people around him feel. A major incident between Rudeus and Eris would have happened very differently if he hadn't been so full of self-doubt, or she had been a better communicator. But while we know what both people think, and that Rudy is suffering because of a misunderstanding, it takes years for him to know the same. There are similar breakdowns in communication between Rudy and other characters, but where we see both sides, and where those breakdowns occurred, we can understand Rudy better than if we only had the information he does. With Rudy being the core, and to a large extent, the point of the story, the more the author gears things towards us understanding him, the better it works. In ReZero, usually the only times we see other characters' perspectives are because Subaru simply isn't in the scene, or because the author thought it would be cool to show us, say, the point of view of the guilty law as it faced Subaru in the mansion in Arc 4, just as an interesting way to switch up the narrative for a chapter. Because of the third-person narrative style, we don't need to switch over to a monologue from Amelia about why she's angry at Subaru in Arc 3, or from Rem about why she doesn't trust him in Arc 2. 
but Subaru is a very different character to Rudy, where the way he acts is usually in line with the way he feels, unless he's consciously trying to be deceptive. Once again, this means that to me, each author has not only picked the best narrative style for his story and protagonist, but has also used creative ways to get the most out of that style, as well as being unafraid to switch it up from time to time when the scene demands it. But enough about structure and narrative style, and all of that technical stuff, let's move on to characters and relationships, and obviously waifus. Now, it's hard to really discuss the similarities and differences between the two series when it comes to the endgame romance element, where Mushoku Tensei is finished, and in ReZero, we actually don't know who Subaru will end up with, or whether there will be a harem situation. I have my own thoughts on this, which I've already talked about in some of my ReZero analysis videos, and the way I see it going will be very different from the romantic situation adult Rudy ends up in, but that's just my expectation, we don't know for sure. However, we can certainly say that the authors have very different approaches and levels of interest when it comes to the sexual side of the protagonist's relationships with others. You don't have to look too far on Twitter or here on YouTube to find someone bashing Mushoku Tensei because of Rudeus's lewd nature at the start of the story, or some of the other more adult stuff featured, like Elena Lise. Just Elena Lise in general, I don't think I have to say anymore, though I do have a video about Elena Lise and Paul if you want to hear more about her. Now, what actually is quite interesting when you read the novels is that while there is a lot of talk of etchy things, whether it's what Rudeus is thinking, the various fetishes the nobles are reputed to have, or actual sexual encounters, there actually aren't any particularly explicit scenes. The scenes are all what we erotica and romance authors call fade to black. We know the characters are going to make the beast with two backs, or six backs if it's Selena Lise. We know why that matters and what it means for the plot, and then we skip to afterwards. Now, how much you approve or disapprove of some of the pairings included, due to things like age or being related or whatever, is going to be down to how much you think it's okay to include stuff that would be immoral in real life, in our world, in works of fiction, with very different settings. Though, just to fan the flames if you're easily freaked out by that kind of stuff, there was a chapter deleted from the Mushoku Tensei redundancy side novel because people complained that it had a woman in her mid-twenties eloping with her 11-year-old nephew in it. And yes, I found it and read it, and yes, I will probably make a video about it someday. But regardless what stuff happens in the story on a conceptual level, it's very difficult to say that any of the more sketchy stuff is there for titillation, rather than because it's part of the plot or important to a character's development. It's not described in any graphic detail, whether it's two married consenting adults or something more dubious. And the Luda stuff Rudy talks about, while he's still in the mindset of a 34-year-old virgin with a porn addiction, is told in that phenomenally unsexy, cringy way I talked about earlier. This stuff is controversial, yes, but it's not erotic, and it's not pandering to an audience. It's just something the writer wanted to feature in both his setting and his main character's issues. ReZero, however, just doesn't really have any lewd stuff in it at all, whether just mentioned or shown. We see a couple of kisses and that's about it. This makes total sense given Subaru is a lot younger and is at an age where it's not like he feels like he missed out on all that stuff in the old world and needs to make up for it now he can. Romance and sex was always something that was likely to be in his future, and he has a fairly normal attitude to these things for a guy his age. He's interested in girls and he wants to be physical, but he's willing to wait, and his desires seem fairly innocent when compared to Rudy, who spiralled into frustrated degeneracy. Well, I mean, there is Subaru's strangulation fetish, but we might just be reading too much into that. In fact, where ReZero has a strong motif of the seven deadly sins, lust, along with gluttony, is one of the sins that really applies to Subaru the least, while for Rudy, it would probably be his most obvious. Conversely, where Subaru probably is most associated with the sin of pride, pride is something Rudeus has virtually none of left at the point of starting his new life, though I digress. 
Tape has said before that he isn't keen on writing harems or sex scenes, and outside of The Lust If, which he wrote for a joke, and which features Subaru living in a harem situation with many of the female characters, we probably shouldn't expect to see too much of that kind of stuff. On the other hand, Tape keeps things adult with the amount of horror and violence in ReZero, which is a lot more frequent, graphic, and, due to the premise, fatal, than the equivalent scenes of physical danger in Mushoku Tensei. That's not to say there's none of that in Mushoku Tensei, or that Magnote stays away from that sort of thing. In fact, there's one bit which will be in the currently airing season, that when I read it in the light novel, I literally looked up and said, did Tape write this chapter? Because it was so similar to ReZero in the way a certain fight that ended badly was written. But for various reasons, there's considerably less gory, rabbits eating Subaru's rectum and brain type stuff. This is one of the strongest differences between the two series and the two authors, but when it comes to relationships and characters, there's another big difference too, the importance of family and bloodlines. In ReZero, from the end of Arc 4 onwards, Subaru exists in a kind of found family situation within the Amelia camp, along with Emilia, Beatrice, Ram, Otto, Garfield, and I guess we could say Rem too. He was summoned to this world, so he doesn't have any blood relatives or people who raised him here, unlike Rudius, who was born into a family with all of its own dramas and responsibilities. Subaru also has no perceived status in this new world, so while that means it's only by meeting influential people early on that he can achieve any, it also means the only politics he has to get involved in, or expectations around who he should be loyal to, are through his own choices and relationships, not through his birth. There are characters who do have families, and whose family situations are explored somewhat, like, say, Garfield, but family drama is not a strong presence in the series, and the karma, slice of life type breather moments in the story are more about interactions between friends than domestic family life. Additionally, while bloodlines have been politically important in Lagunica in the past, they aren't now, and the royal selection is a hybrid of chosen ones and democracy, rather than succession. This is very different from Mushoku Tensei, where family is everything, both in Rudy's own story and the way the world works. Again, these are things that make sense for each respective story. Because it takes place over a shorter time period, where ReZero has some families in interesting circumstances, like the Van Astreas, the majority of the stories leading up to their dramas are in the past, before Subaru met them, meaning the story need only focus on the resolutions or consequences of those dramas. In Mushoku Tensei, however, we can see characters like Rudy's sisters and childhood friends grow up. We can remember the dramas between different family members because we saw them happen even if it was 10 years ago in the story, and there's even the scope for things like Rudius raising his own children on page. If Subaru ever does that, it will likely be in an epilogue, unless you count the Remif, which I don't. But with the focus being less on family, ReZero does manage to avoid what I think is one of the only slight negatives to Mushoku Tensei when it comes to characters and relationships, and that is that, well, there's almost never a character introduced, no matter where in the world Rudius goes, or how important the character is going to be, who isn't in some way related to, or connected to, someone he already knows from somewhere else, or who knows someone related to him. This isn't so much a defect in the storytelling, it's more kind of an affordance that is often used in fantasy, that makes the story more interesting if anything and stops the cast from feeling bloated with random people. But at the same time, it can make what is actually a large and well-explored world feel a lot smaller than it should. Even without spoiling anything after the anime, you can already see that even after being randomly teleported to another continent, the first settlement Rudy goes to just happens to be Roxy's hometown, and then later he ends up in Ghislaine's hometown after being falsely imprisoned on a different continent again. At this point, he hasn't even met that many people yet, being only 10 when he's teleported, so the odds of meeting the families of two of the only people you know in the whole world while visiting different continents, and in no way looking for those people, should be remarkably slim. 
Later in the story, as Rudius becomes more renowned or notorious, and certain plots come into play that would cause people to actually seek him out, this all becomes more plausible. And as I said, it's not a terrible thing. As long as you can suspend your disbelief, it can make it more interesting. But I think the need to suspend your disbelief and just enjoy the coincidences, rather than them feeling natural, is a side effect of having, at the same time, both a large world for the story to cover and a focus on family dynamics. Now, Tape also doesn't tend to introduce too many characters who are only going to appear for one scene or event, but where there's less of a focus on family, it is more usual in ReZero that a new character encountered randomly will not be in some way related or connected to someone who's already in the story. Plus, with most of the story so far taking place in only one country, it's somewhat more plausible when coincidental meetings do happen. I would say there's only one instance of this in ReZero that feels really unlikely to a similar degree to some of the encounters in Mushoku Tensei, and that involves Garfield in Arc 5. But where ReZero isn't finished and we don't know the mysteries around things in that series, there may be a justification for that sort of coincidence later, probably involving Pandora, obviously. But what about the quality of the supporting characters themselves? Well, I'd say ReZero and Mushoku Tensei are about equal when it comes to having interesting characters with depth to them that are rarely just tropes. I find ReZero's characters a bit more iconic, but Mushoku Tensei is slightly better explored, though this could be down to having those occasional bits where they're narrating things, as well as the fact that the story is finished, so much of the exploration of many ReZero characters may well just be later on. In terms of character development, both series handle this well in my opinion, but through entirely different approaches. In ReZero, we're given that motif of sins and virtues that is ever present in the story to judge the characters against, and the trials they go through, including some actual literal trials, cause them to understand their failings and the paths they need to follow to become better or stronger. They have to grow and change fairly rapidly in comparison to Mushoku Tensei, so generally there will be an event that serves as a catalyst or a new bond, confrontation or reunion with someone that causes them to learn or change perspective, rather than them just getting older and more experienced as a natural slow burn thing over the course of many years. There's a big focus on the need to rely on others and not try to do things alone, but this power of friendship message so common in anime is somewhat deconstructed here because the more people Subaru cares about and needs, the more people he puts pressure on himself to save, and the more difficult it becomes to get an acceptable outcome. In Mushoku Tensei, everybody is just shown warts and all, and like the people around them, we have to accept that not every negative personality trait needs to be confronted or developed out of them for them to have had some satisfying character development. In Mushoku Tensei, every person can be many things at once, even seemingly contradictory things, just like in real life. A womanizer who doesn't seem to take life seriously can also be reliable. A charismatic, beautiful and kind princess can also be politically ruthless and a freak in bed. An impulsive and arrogant woman can also be sweet and a good mother. One character even has an alter ego that is vastly different from their normal persona, but they're both genuine sides of who that character is. People can see the errors of their ways and grow and develop, but nobody will attain perfection, no matter how many character arcs they go through, and yet they can still have value to the world and be precious to you. In a story spanning decades like Mushoku Tensei, characters need the complexity to allow them to change and grow in some ways, but also to retain some of their flaws, and the story definitely achieves this. But when it comes to side characters, the real question is, which series has the least annoying child maid character who has a crush on the protagonist? And the answer is Mushoku Tensei. Don't at me, Petra fans. Next, I want to look at the mechanics of the series. So, magic systems, power ratings, and so on. Now, the actual magic systems themselves aren't all that different. There's elemental magic at different levels of potency in both. You have to use mana, which people have in varying amounts. 
People with particular talent are able to combine elemental spells to create new effects, and then there are things like magical objects in the mix too. There are some differences, such as in Mushoku Tensei, the elemental spells are considered offensive spells, and there's a whole different class of magic for healing and detoxification, as well as classes of magic that require magic circles for things like summoning. In ReZero, healing is done primarily with water magic, and the magic system also has yin and yang as magical elements, as well as the four usual ones. Incantations are a thing in Mushoku Tensei too, as are wands and staffs, whereas these don't seem to be necessary for magic use at all in ReZero. Mushoku Tensei goes into a lot more detail about the magic system and the different levels of mages, with this being something that, once you're familiar with it, you can easily use to understand how powerful someone is just by hearing their level in a given type of magic. ReZero doesn't tend to classify magic users beyond the elements they use, and also doesn't really assign ranks in terms of skill, even if the spells are ranked. Instead, in ReZero, there are just titles given to the single strongest user of each elemental magic type in Lagunica, with Roswell holding red, yellow and green as the strongest user of earth, air and fire, and Felix holding blue as the strongest water magic user. This is almost certainly because in Mushoku Tensei, the protagonist becomes a powerful magic user, and these are things he learns and uses constantly throughout the story. In ReZero, Subaru's use of magic is extremely minimal, with him breaking his gate in Arc 4 and being unable to use it at all after that. Additionally, in ReZero's setting, unlike Mushoku Tensei's, the concept of professional adventurers and labyrinths isn't really a thing. Or if it is, it isn't really anything to do with the story as yet. So being very adept at magic is really something fewer people would value and pursue. Instead, in ReZero, the secondary magic system the world has gets explored more, divine protections and authorities. This is more interesting in ReZero than the universal magic system, as it can give a character a unique skill that is outside of normal magic. Mushoku Tensei has an equivalent in the form of blessed or cursed children, or Miko, who are born with similar special abilities. However, these people are far rarer in that setting, with someone like that being seen as a national treasure if their ability is useful. In ReZero, a lot of people have divine protections, of varying degrees of usefulness, but in Mushoku Tensei, you can count the number of characters with blessings like this on one hand. Magic users equivalent to Roswell, however, are far more commonplace, probably due to, again, the fact that there is a lot of work you can find as a powerful mage in a world where RPG-style adventurers guilds and dungeon diving are a thing. Both settings also have some race-specific magic that only people of a given non-human race can perform, like in Mushoku Tensei, the paralyzing voice magic of the Beastmen, or the telepathic communication of Roxy's Migurd tribe, or in ReZero, the Berserker mode of the Oni and Ram's Clairvoyance, or Fred and Garfield's ability to transform into big cats. But again, due to the fact it's relevant to several major characters and useful for adventurers in the setting, another thing that has a much more detailed system in Mushoku Tensei is sword arts. Fortunately, the power rankings, which are beginner, intermediate, advanced, saint, king, emperor, and god, are the same for sword fighters as for mages, so it's easy to remember and understand, though a sword saint is far less impressive than it is in ReZero. There are three main fighting styles, and while a lot of martial artists in the setting study more than one to some degree, they usually dedicate themselves to the one that suits them best. There are also other fighting styles scattered around the world, as you might expect, but these three sword art styles are the only ones with those rankings, which everyone recognises. In ReZero, while it's also possible for people who fight with swords to do seemingly supernatural things with them, there isn't really that level of distinction between the martial arts or a given swordsman's level. This is probably for the same reason as with the magic system. It isn't important for Subaru, as he never uses a sword, and the number of people who would study sword fighting to a high level are far fewer, where the only roles for them would be as soldiers, knights, or mercenaries, rather than adventurers. 
Outside of the Van Astrea family, who are all a bit special anyway. The only person whose sword fighting capabilities are all that important in the story is Julius. Whereas in Mushoku Tensei, semi-magical sword stuff is important for a lot more characters. Now, I did say this was going to be an in-depth comparison, but I feel like it's getting super long now, so I'm going to finish up by talking about world building before concluding with some final thoughts on the two series and which one is my slight favourite. So, a lot of people I've seen comparing Mushoku Tensei and ReZero in Twitter arguments say the world building is one of the areas where Mushoku Tensei is stronger than ReZero. Now, perhaps if you're anime only and comparing like for like, so maybe season one of both series, I can see why you might think that, because Mushoku Tensei does spend longer on world building early in the story, and does visit more parts of the world early on. This is to be expected really, given Subaru has to learn about the world he's in on the fly, while immediately dealing with life or death situations, and we only get to learn with him. Whereas Rudius gets to grow up and learn about the world in the same way anyone else there would, before anything dangerous happens. This just inherently allows for us to find out more about the world and lore in the beginning, but what it doesn't mean is that ReZero's setting and lore is any less fleshed out or interesting. We just uncover things about it in different ways, and there's far less travel between countries just due to what's going on in the plot. Having finished Mushoku Tensei and being up to date on the ReZero web novel, I'd say they're both equally good with the world building and the history and lore of the settings, but for different reasons. I think that Mushoku Tensei does a really good job of taking a lot of things from classic fantasy settings and making them work as a world that feels real and logical in its own way, whereas ReZero does a great job of giving us a highly creative take on a fantasy world that's familiar enough to have that medieval isekai world feeling, but is also extremely unique and surprising, as well as being inherently loaded with mysteries. Mushoku Tensei has all of the fantasy stuff you can think of. I mean, it even has hobbits, the Tolkien race most people think is too lame to include. It has actual RPG dungeons with loot inside them. It has a floating sky castle called Chaos Breaker, which is the coolest, most tuny thing I've ever heard of. It has immortal beings, oceans full of sea-dwelling races, and the highborn humans that love a bit of Game of Thrones style scheming and intrigue. It's that mix of medieval fantasy with swords and sorcery, and what makes it good rather than generic is how well it's implemented, and how every location feels as different in both culture and landscape as it would in a real world. There are different languages, currencies, religions, wildlife, cuisine, and so on, and yet it's described in a way that always feels relevant to what's happening in the story, rather than an author feeling like they have to cram all the world building they filled out 50 notebooks with, whether it's interesting or not. Even the dungeons and adventuring, something that can be really hard to explain and justify as a real thing that would exist outside of a game, has been thought through enough to make the existence of the labyrinths and the economy around them make sense. They feel like they belong in this world, rather than that this world is like a game and we're going to pretend it makes sense because it's cool. There's nothing wrong with pretending that it makes sense because it's cool either in a fantasy story, it's just a lot more immersive if you can pull it off so that it actually does feel like this world could function. ReZero's world, however, is a lot more of an oddity. Yes, it has the medieval looking towns and aristocratic mansions, it has the elves and oni and beastmen and dragons, but it also has a lot of very mysterious things about it that are probably there by design to fit with things we're yet to learn about the world's existence, but which we can't really explain. The world of ReZero is flat, yet it has night and day and month cycles similar to the Earth. The stars look different, causing Subaru to wonder if it's the sky of the very distant future, but there are stars. The world was, according to history, half consumed by the Witch of Envy during the Great Calamity, but we don't really know exactly what that means in practical terms. The people in this world speak Japanese, though they use a different writing system, and we know that they speak Japanese rather than Subaru being able to communicate because of some translation magic, because he notices that Anastasia, 
like most people from Kararagi, speaks the Kansai dialect, something Al, who is also from our world, confirms. This world, particularly Kararagi, which was itself founded by an isekai person named Hoshin of the Wastes, is definitely influenced by our own, with even the cuisine and architecture in Kararagi being very Japanese. There are also anomalies, like Daphne the Witch of Gluttony being able to create the White Whale as a witch beast, despite the world of ReZero having no oceans, and therefore no whales. There are nobles and knights, but the royal selection is very different to any medieval-influenced battle for a throne, and very distinct from typical fantasy world politics. Alongside the commonly used fantasy races like elves and giants, there are also some more unique concepts for non-human races, like the steel folk who can be found in Valachia. There are magical beasts that fill the role monsters normally would in a fantasy setting, but these also tend to be unique in their concepts, rather than familiar to D&D players, and there are mysteries around them too. The history of the world that we're told mainly centres around one period 400 years ago, the Age of Witches, though the lore is also fleshed out to include other important periods like the Demi-Human War. All of these things give more information and insight into the major personalities and events that contributed to, well, whatever it is that's going on now, making the world feel complex and intriguing, but full of a thousand questions to try to figure out. Yes, there are only four major countries in ReZero's world, and as yet, Subaru has only been to two of them, far less of an explorer than Rudius at the same point in his story. But you don't have to detail and show a whole world to have good world building. We only see a couple of locations in Attack on Titan too, but the world still feels complicated and interesting, and Land of the Lustrous has a fascinating setting, despite mostly taking place on one small island for a large part of the story. I hope we do get to see all of the main countries in ReZero, but even if we don't, what we learn about them from characters who come from them do make them feel like important parts of this world, with distinct cultures and their own different and interesting cities and other key locations. An interesting world full of potential for fantastic and unusual experiences is pretty much an essential for an isekai story, and while a medieval style fantasy setting is only one possible choice, it is the most common one. With Mushoku Tensei, Maganote chose to create his own take on the classic sword and sorcery setting that would inspire awe in his protagonist, whereas Tape with ReZero aimed for a more highly mysterious world where his protagonist would constantly be questioning what his own connection to it was. These worlds are both, to me, brilliantly designed for the stories that play out in them and very thoroughly thought through, so I could never say one was stronger on world building than the other once a reasonable amount of the story has been seen. I will concede that Mushoku Tensei front loads it a bit more though, so I can see where anime onlys might be coming from there. So for the final verdict, which one do I prefer? Well, I have a slight recency bias towards Mushoku Tensei, where I only just finished reading it, and it is of course airing right now as an anime. But I feel like when that's worn off and I've read all the side stories and the season is over, I'll probably go back to having a very slight preference for ReZero. But as I said in the beginning, the reasons for it are not down to writing quality or anything else I can analyse, it's just down to my own taste. I'm less keen on the domestic family type stuff that forms the slice of life parts in Mushoku Tensei than on the more wacky stuff ReZero's less stressful chapters goes for. To be honest, I was expecting to dislike those parts of Mushoku Tensei much more than I did, because while I knew that a story covering someone's whole life would inevitably mean chapters about babies and small children, which are to me as interesting as soil, there's usually something else going on in those periods of the story that is a bit more connected to the parts of it I like, so there's really something for everyone. That stuff is absolutely important to the story, don't get me wrong. I was just expecting to have to trudge through a lot more domestic wholesome stuff that just really isn't to my taste to get to the exciting parts than I actually did, so that was cool. This is also the reason I don't like the Remif as much as the other ReZero Ifruits, by the way. 
The other thing I prefer about ReZero is that although we don't know the ending, it feels like it's building up to resolve everything it's setting up. That the period of time in this world that Subaru is living through is the most important time in the setting. Mushoku Tensei, while complete and while having a satisfying conclusion to Rudius's story, feels, without spoiling anything, more like a prequel to the most important time in the setting, in terms of the conflicts it established and the fate of the world itself. Now, the story does clue you in that this will likely be the case fairly early on, so it manages your expectations just fine, but it also leaves you wanting to know how later events will all work out. Hopefully there will be a sequel series, and if there is, I'm sure it will be amazing. But with ReZero, I feel more like when it does end, we won't be feeling like it needs a sequel. Saying that, it's already longer, and it'll be many years before it ends, and so maybe we'll get that Mushoku Tensei continuation concluded within that same time frame. Who knows? Plus, I could be wrong about ReZero there, or it could have a conclusive ending that just doesn't live up to expectations, whereas with Mushoku Tensei, I can already say that the climax and ending was good, so it's not really a done deal on that one anyway. And besides, is the prospect of the story continuing with a new protagonist even a negative? For me it is because I'm impatient and want to know everything now, but in reality it just means there's a lot more scope for entertainment to come out of the world the authors created, without it feeling like a needless cash grab sequel. So actually, it's a good thing, as long as it actually happens. But what do you guys think? If you've watched this far, then thank you so much. I hope it was interesting, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of the topics discussed in this video in the comments. As always, a huge thank you to my supporters on Patreon, and to all of you who helped me out by subscribing to my channel and watching my content. Thank you for watching this behemoth of an analysis video, and I hope to see you again very soon.